Yeah. Welcome everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is Mel Tempra. I'm going to be hosting the Green Wind Resources webinar today. Um, we have Peter Wright and we have Rick Anthon who will be joining us in a moment. Um, lots to go through. Peter will do a, a presentation um, followed by the opportunity to ask both Peter and Rick questions. Um, there's a chat function. If you have any questions, please um, drop them into the chat function. We will get through as many as we can in the limited time. If we do not get to um, your question, please feel free to email me. I'll drop that email address in the chat also. Um, but for now, we'll hand over to Peter Wright. And uh, Peter, would you like to um, start your presentation? Well, thanks, Mel. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time today, um, wherever you're watching from. Um, we've come with a new tagline here, which we think reflects uh, the ambition of the company connecting connected for an electrified tomorrow. We, we've deliberately aligned the company, uh, Rick and I, over several years to what we see as irreversible trends. Um, so the global economy shifts to a lower carbon intensity. And, you know, for us, that's found form in lithium and graphite, which I'll run through now. Uh, I'm in trouble here, Mel, with the... Uh, well, where is that going? Yeah. Apologies for this. Okay, thank you. So I'll just get back to the disclaimer there, which is important. Um, I could have a look at that and consider that. I'll get to the formal presentation. Um, why Greenwind? So we just tried to come up with a summary here. Um, we think we're very well positioned at present. Obviously, lithium slash graphite markets have been very difficult um, over the last 12 months, particularly the last six months um, for equity prices, been as a result primarily of lithium uh, retracting um, across spodumene, hydroxide and, and carbonate considerably over the back end of last year. That's continued into this year. I make the point that we're at a juncture where we're not looking to sell into the current market. You know, we're looking to align to supply demand um, deficits out three to four years, especially at San Jorge. Uh, the general consensus still is that you look at three to four years' time that you do have enduring deficits in lithium and graphite. Um, what we're seeing at the moment reminds me a lot of iron ore over the early 2000s. Uh, there were several pauses and savage pullbacks in the iron ore price over that time. But um, you know, last time I checked, the iron ore price was still circa $135 a tonne and not the 15 to 20 that it used to be, um, the turn of the century. And we're currently drilling. Uh, we're drilling in two jurisdictions. The main one is in Argentina at our San Jorge Lithium Project. Uh, we completed a, an initial three-hole program, which we're happy with the results. I would stress that the initial drill program, uh, whilst delivering really good results, um, you know, we, we are drilling off sailor. You know, the, the visible mineralisation is the sailor. The results that we've had to date, you know, the surface samples were in the like, were in the quantum of 50 to 70 um, milligrams per litre lithium. When we move to the middle of the sailor next year, you know, we are starting at circa 200, 289 milligrams per litre lithium. So next year we expect... Um, have very different results to these ones. Notwithstanding, we're very happy with the results that we've had to date. They've all been at or around 200 milligrams per litre of lithium, which is directly comparable to several of our peers. About this time last year, we managed to close off an investment with a major New York Stock Exchange listed automotive manufacturer, Neo Inc., um, out of China, a very impressive company. We have a fantastic board management and uh, structure of employees sitting beneath that board, which I'll get through in a minute. Uh, Rick and myself, and we came together with, with what was then Bass um, eight or nine years ago, resolved to deliberately align this company with what we saw as irreversible but then emerging trends um, in lithium and graphite and two commodities that we saw you know, over the longer term in enduring deficits. Uh, the board has production experience outside of Greenwing and within it. 
um, we've all been on boards that have operated mines, including our graph mine graphite project in northwest, northeastern Madagascar. Just touching on the board there, um, and Rick is online today, in the next room, in fact, uh, he'll be taking question and answers later. So we're lucky enough to have Rick within the company, and Rick was with the various iterations of Oracobra, or Chem, uh, since its inception, saw it go from a sub $20 million company through to an eight to $9 billion um, major lithium stock listed on the ASX, which has recently become Levant. Um, we're looking forward to Rick's further involvement and broader involvement in the company this year, myself in particular. Um, we have James Brown there, who people might be aware of. He's the CEO of Sayona and also Morella at present. Extensive production experience, ASX experience. Uh, Jeff Marvin is on there, who's next Wall Street financier. He's been um, fantastic for us over the seven or eight year journey that we've had so far. We have a NEO representative there, Alan Zen, who's very happy to have on the board. Has brought several perspectives that we just weren't considering. It's great to have him on there. And Angus Craig, who's a deeply experienced company CFO um, and company secretary. So just at an overview of the company, you know, we, the vehicles that we have invested in to align to decarbonisation is firstly the graphite project Graphmata in northeastern Madagascar. You know, we inherited an asset with four and a half million tonnes. We've expanded that to 62 million tonnes now. We produced successfully for 18 months. Um, delivered in all major markets. The status of that project at the moment is we are looking to come back with a much greater production volume uh, and secure a strategic partner to help us get there. Um, that said, the main focus of the company at present is lithium. Um, with the onset of COVID, Rick and I made a decision that we'd like to expand both the jurisdictional and commodity risk within the company, but still aligning to those broader themes that, that we both identified. Um, we settled on due to Rick's experience in Argentina and the Lithium Triangle in particular, the San Jorge project. Uh, we've now secured funding for that. We're currently drilling. We've said to the market and still on track to deliver a maiden resource estimate in the first quarter of this year. We're very happy with how the drilling has gone so far. We'll talk a bit more about that as we move through the presentation. Uh, a bit more on San Jorge. I visited San Jorge in December last year. The first thing that strikes you is what a large footprint it has. You know, it's a it's a 26, 2800 hectare salar. Uh, it's quite large. It's kilometres across in places. Um, it has not been drilled to date. Uh, we're currently drilling it. It's 15 contiguous exploration leases. So we have 100% of that. We have 100% of the salar. We have 100% of all the ground surrounding the sailor. You know, we're in proximity to the, the Zijin project, uh, ironically, the old NEO project, NEO, not NIO, as per our major shareholder. Uh, the initial results were really encouraging. At surface, we have to 285 milligrams a litre lithium across um, the sailor. The geophysics was highly encouraging. And as per public disclosures to date, we're very happy with how the off sailor drilling has gone to date. Uh, we completed the first three hole program in the peripheries of the sailor, all holes one to three, uh, returned above or at above or around 200 milligrams a litre. We also had, which we put in for the first time in our last ASX release, elevated potassium levels, which can be potentially a useful byproduct of potash. Several of the Chilean and Argentine sailors produce potash as well as lithium concentrates. Um, we are on target and are looking to table our maiden resource estimate by the end of this quarter. You can just see there, um, what is particularly interesting, and there's limited I can say about hole four, I'll get to in a moment, but there's long been a view that a little bit like Galana, Dombre, Murto, that there's the potential for the mineralization to extend to the west off the sailor, which you can see there to the left of the um, of the figure, their figure one with the green, that's the visible sailor. You know, we are of a view that it extends materially out to the west and there's potential to add to the resource, not just visible to the sailor. Uh, it might be sitting there under 10 to 30 metres of cover. 
you can see there in the next diagram. So we are now in an update on hole four. We were at the last time we uh, spoke to the market, 320 metres depth. Um, we've continued uh, that over the last couple of weeks. We're just finishing that hole up now. We'll then be moving to hole five. Um, we've drilled, the, we've graded the pads for drill holes five and six, so they can proceed reasonably rapidly. So moving on to hole five over the next few days, then finally hole six, and then uh, tabulating a resource from that. Clear development pathway for San Hall Hay. You can see there from the start when we got the project, the brine samples had surface up to 285 milligrams a litre. That's off. That's from the sailor. As I said, the results we've had at the moment at or around 200 milligrams a litre have been off sailor and are correlating to sam surface samples of sort of 70 milligrams a litre lithium. So we expect, can't promise, that uh, the grades go up in the middle of the sailor. Uh, we'll be drilling... We're anticipating we drill six holes there in the middle of the sailo over the course of this year. Um, we, you know, it appears to us at present that it will be a DLE resource. We've signed NDAs with various providers. We've sent samples to various providers. We're looking to table those results as well over the next quarter. Um, we rolled over from the first drill program of three holes into the second program, which we're doing now. So we're, as I just said, starting on hole five over the next few days and hole six then the maiden mineral resource, um, and then we will have further discussions on how we, or when we, which path we take the project forward on. Obviously, with the drilling over the course of this year, we we'll looking to expand the resource as well. We're in the lithium triangle in Argentina. I like to refer to that as the, the lithium triangle is to lithium what the Pilbara is to iron ore. Most of the world, a majority of the world's lithium production comes from there. It's a, it's a place of significant development. It's a good jurisdiction to mine in. We're in Catamarca, um, which is relatively new to lithium, but um, if we haven't had any problems to date. Uh, we're very happy operating there. You know, services, staff are readily available. Um, it's been reasonably smooth sailing post getting our permits in place. And you know, there have been several transactions, admittedly, in a different market, to the one that we're in at the moment, um, you know, that would place our project in, in, in a pretty strong context with the current share price and market capitalisation. Um, just moving on to the balance of the company's assets before we take um, questions. Uh, we have a hard rock project in Madagascar, Millie's Reward. Um, we're at a point with Millie's Reward in Madagascar where we're waiting for the passage of the new mining code the um, new mining code has passed both Houses of Parliament in Madagascar. It has passed the Constitutional Court. It now only awaits presidential ratification. The president has recently been re-elected in Madagascar. Um, so we're looking or hoping um, that that gets concluded soon, allow us to really develop rapidly or move rapidly at Millie's reward. The surface signature is... Pretty compelling. Um, 31 metre trench sample at 3.7% lithium. It's not too far from the capital, Antananarivo. Um, so there's available infrastructure there, roads, everything else. Uh, there are several high priority targets within the area. And you, we are hoping with the passage of the mining code this year to get back to progressing that project. As I said, the first iteration of Greenwing, still very much a part of Greenwing, is our graphite mine that we built in northeastern Madagascar. We've put a lot of work into this. We There are two types of graphite. Um, there's hard rock resources, which I liken to magnetite, and there's soft rock resources, which are a little bit more like hematite. They're lower processing, they're lower power. Uh, they are lower grade um, than hard rock, but... You don't have to liberate it from solid ore. You know, they are what's called a saprolite host unit. The, the graphite is, is easily liberated. And just as importantly, your flake size, which where a lot of the value is in graphite concentrates, is preserved. So ours is 91% large flake and above in situ. That was compromising down to about 40 to 45% large flake and above in, in our product 
um, over the time that we produced. We sold into all major markets. Importantly, we qualified uh, into all major markets as well. So the status of that project at present is Rick and myself have started a process to attract a strategic investor. The best iteration of the graphite mine is on significantly expanded production. We don't have an interest in putting it back into production at the 6,000 tonnes per annum. Um, but certainly, you know, anywhere above 45 to 50,000 tonnes per annum, that becomes a project of great significance. Um, a lot of the capital for stage two has been spent on stage one, all the infrastructures there, camps, roads, bridges, um, haulage roads. You can see there, it's a current resource of 61.9 million tonnes at four and a half, which is globally significant. We are drilling at the moment at a second project called Andapa, which is 60 kilometres closer to the port. But each time we've drilled, um, we've had a material increase in the size of the resource. Um, just touch briefly on a strategic partnership in there. We're very happy to have NEO as our major shareholder. They've been great to deal with. They're an interesting company with what they've achieved in a relatively short period of time. They're in the process of building what could be described as, as their gigafactory um, but behind Shanghai. It's called Neo Park. You know, they they have three base models of cars. You know, they've recently received European five-star ANCAP safety rating, which is deeply impressive. You know, they're premium cars. And the reality is, at least as we see it, is to continue their growth trajectory. You know, they're looking to ultimately get to a million um, vehicles a year sold, which they're well on the way to achieving. They need a significant amount of lithium and hence the association with, with Greenwing. And I won't go through the appendices. So, Melissa, I'm, I'm happy there to, to turn this over to, to question and answers. Both Rick and myself um, can answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Um, before I do go to some questions, just to let everybody know who's tuned in, at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box, a Q and a any questions, now's your time to ask. Um, so, yeah, throw them in there. Um, Rick, is there anything um, before we go to Q&A that you wanted to touch on from that presentation? Um, I know that Peter got into a bit of a flow. So, um, or should we go straight to Q&A, Rick? I think we could probably, uh, look, apart from commenting, um, taking it where Peter left on, the Sand, Sandhill Hay project is, a, is, a, is an exciting project. It's, a, it's potentially a very large project. It's got great access to infrastructure. We've got we've got a we've got a good partner. We've got a very good team in. Uh, we've got a very good team in in Argentina that's working on it, and and we're we're, we're getting the we're getting the sort of results that we anticipated uh, getting when we when we started this process um, when we first started looking at San Jorge as a very early stage exploration project more than two years ago, and I said. It's also important to note, and I think as Peter might have said, that you know, this is the San Jorge Solar. It's a thirty-eight thousand hectares, and it's and it's basically ours. We're not we're not sharing this with anybody else. We've got a lot of room for for uh, for development. So yeah, it's a it's an exciting project. So yeah, but happy to take happy to take questions, Melissa. Thanks. I have got um one question that is just. You know the main difference between the hard rock. We we hear so much about hard rock lithium, but not you know. And and Brian is studying the Brian study to be talked about so much more at the moment. What is the benefit of exploration for lithium brines? I think I think the exploration for it's not so much the benefit isn't so much in the in the exploration. The benefit of of a uh, of a brine project is in the is in the processing path. I mean. Uh, when you when you have a you know, when you have a brine project, ultimately you are producing you are, you will be producing a lithium product from your project. Uh, obviously, when you're producing a if you are a Western Australian spodumene, what you're doing <clears throat> what you're doing is digging up hard rock. You're beneficiating that or concentrating that up, trying to bring it up to a <clears throat> to a, a five or six percent concentrate, and then you're you're selling uh, you're selling a uh, a concentrate across to Chinese converters. Yeah, so I suppose a little bit facetiously, I always think of having been involved in a a brine producing company that that um, uh, the hard rock guys are a little bit like using Peter's example. That it's a little bit like iron ore. You're not actually in the lithium business. You're in a you're in an input business of supplying a key input uh, into the ultimate production of the end product. Whereas the, whereas the brine, 
um, whereas the bride actually is will will be turned by you into a uh, into a into a finished product. And generally, uh, and generally, you will do it cheaper uh, and more efficiently and in a cleaner a cleaner manner uh, than the spodumene produced uh, lithium products. Yeah, so um, in terms of, I've got one question, um, Peter, maybe one for you since you've just come back um, and we've had a bit of a discussion about this, but the Argentinian government, um, yes. how supportive are they of, of your project and, and mining in general? Look, I'll, I'll answer that specifically and then maybe for the broader context, Rick can give an overview on politics in Argentina. So we're in Catamarca province. So Rick and I have met the mining minister. We've met people from government departments. Recently come back from there, was in Catamarca City, had some meetings there, met with the local mayor in Fiambala, which is the town that uh, Zajin and ourselves um, share for services. Um, you know, in the regions, it's not too dissimilar to Australia. You know, they, they, they want investment out there. They want jobs, um, with people. It's 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 relatively impoverished compared to the city. Um, at a federal level, um, they've elected uh, what I would describe as a as an economic rationalist. Um, you know, he is looking at all sorts of pro market. Did he? An economic rationalist believes in market outcomes and supply equals demand, and he's looking at nationalising. So. Um, publicly floating companies like Aerolinas Argentinas and the petrol stations over there. So yeah, that sort of agenda aligns with business, it aligns with investment. Um, you know, they have, and Rick said to me previously, you know, despite what the laws are, the Argentines always seem to find a way, and, and I think that's true. But, um, look, his agenda seems to be pro-business. It seems to be government getting out of the way um, of business. His, his view is that there's a bloated government bureaucracy in Argentina that is stunting the country's growth and um, he wants, you know, that infrastructure to get out of the way of investment and um, an effort and people progressing. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the current president, um, the, the majority that he received in, in, in the vote last year was the biggest endorsement of any presidential candidate since uh, the since uh, free elections commenced in or recommenced in Argentina back in the in the early 80s there is there is a serious push or a serious recognition uh, that that change is required along the lines that Peter was outlining in terms of having a having a rational uh, market-based focus uh, on uh, on on what, you, what on how you take a, a country which has great people and has great resources, but has been hamstrung by poor policy decisions. So there's a there's a recognition, I think, a general recognition that things have to change, and you have a change change agent in there. Now, is that going to be a smooth path and a, and a linear path? Absolutely, absolutely not. It's going to be a, it's it's going to be a, uh, an interesting ride. But but again, having been exposed to Argentinian politics since the early two thousands. I'm, I'm yeah, quietly optimistic that you've got you you do have a significant mood change, and and said it won't be a won't be a linear fashion, and there's going to be a few bumps in the road. Um, but uh, but it, as I said, there is this recognition that, that that things have to change, and that a lot of those policies, like the restrictive foreign exchange policies, they're they're already on the way out. You've seen a You've seen a very rational approach to the to the to a devaluation and a heart and a, and a big devaluation, which is which was required uh, of of the peso. So yeah, I think I think it'll be it'll be interesting, but but I think it's I think it's generally positive for Argentina in the longer run. Thanks, guys. So there's actually a couple of questions um, about direct extraction technology. Yes. Um, so. Is it likely to work commercially feasible? Is it has it been proven at large scale? I think on the uh, proven at large scale, uh, yes, because it's been operating in China for some time, and yes, Levent, which is now Arcadian, uh, has been running direct lithium extraction at Hombro Murdo since since nineteen ninety nine. Um, pe people sometimes uh, forget that fact because uh, that before it was Levent, it was sitting inside M FMC and had a pretty low profile. Um, it's it's now post the merger with with Orchem. It's it's now potentially the third largest lithium producing uh, 
company uh, in the in the world and one of their core assets at Hombre Murdo runs a straight direct lithium a, a straight DLE direct lithium extraction process so yes it does work are there competing technologies out there yes there, there are a lot and there's some really really exciting and interesting stuff going on um as those technologies tend to be brine the chemistry tends to work uh, on a brine specific or a project specific basis and and that's what we're doing we we're, we're, we're we're in a position now with this drill program to be taking bulk samples and supplying them to to a number of the potential providers. And as as Peter touched on in his uh, in in um, his presentation, that's that's part of the program over the next uh, over the next three to six months. So yes, it does work. Uh, it it can work at, at uh, economically on on these types of uh, on these types of deposits, and that's what we're working through now. So another question, um, it's pretty, it's a pretty simple question. And I think um, most companies get asked this when it comes to a drilling campaign. Um, it seems to be taking a long time. Is that a, a, a fair assessment? Um, is it on track from a, a, as far as um, you were concerned, Peter and Rick? Um, and if it is um, slow to some extent, do you, is there reasons for a delay? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's probably, better to look at that in terms of our program. And, and uh, I think as, as you're right, everybody gets asked these questions. Our program, once it started, it, it is, we had a, we had a um, two, two events that slowed us down. One was simply getting permitted. Uh, and that did take, and you know, we, we're, we're on record as saying that, that that took longer than we had anticipated. Um, that, that is, that was a function of dealing with a uh, Catamarca mining uh, a mining department that was you know, overwhelmed uh, by companies looking for uh, looking for drilling permits, and we we stuck with it and made um, and worked with the work with the department and and got the and got the necessary permits that have enabled us to uh, enabled us to kick off. So yes, that 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 was disappointing, but you know, one of those things operating in you know, it, that you come across in resources. Uh, we also had I wouldn't call it a false start but but we did change we did swap out drilling contractors after or during the the course of the the first yeah. the first hole um but since that has occurred uh Peter I think I think we'd say we've been yeah you know, we've been very happy with the 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 progress and the current current contractors you know, doing a great job yeah absolutely and I echo what you're saying so Mel, we obviously had um delays with permitting at the start we don't have those anymore. Um, we had originally contracted literally the only driller available in Catamarca. Some of that activity has subsided. Um, there's been a lot more availability of services. We made the decision halfway through Hole 1 that we just didn't think we were going to get to where we needed to in the time we needed to with the initially drilled contractor. That was no one's fault. We contracted a driller, the only one available. Uh, we have a fantastic um, consultant working with us, Murray Brooker, who's been critical in the discovery of several major deposits over there and has been there for a long time. And we came to the view that we did need a new driller. With his experience, we managed to get an outstanding one. Um, we mobilised them to camp at the same time as the initial drillers were there. We didn't want to cease on uh, hold one until the new drill crew was there. But, yeah, I, I agree with what Rick's saying. Since then... Um, inclusive of a re-entry to hole one uh, and going 80 odd metres deeper and improving the grade and doing holes two, three, four, um, grading the pads for five and six. We've established a camp over there. It's 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 a good camp. We've graded all the roads around the sailor. Yeah, you can drive around the sailor now. We're grading roads out to the middle of the sailor for next year. So, um, I absolutely understand people's frustrations uh, with our maiden drill program. It is the first time that this sailor has ever been drilled um, or off sailor as we are at the moment, but we're very happy with the progress now. Um, as I said, we're just finishing up at hole four. Uh, we're quite happy with that. Um, moving on to hole five, then six, and a mineral resource estimate by the end of, of March, which that just would not have been happening if we'd stayed with the originally contracted drillers. Yeah, and, that, and you know, that's not far away and that's exciting and and having worked with you, you know, I work with you guys and I know how much work 
is being put into daily. So, um, you know, it's, you know, having this webinar is, is, um, is one step to being able to continually to show your shareholders that um, and, and share that activity that is continually happening. Um, so I'm going to, um, most shareholders are always wanting to know about return on their investment. Yes. Um, and, you know, the, the tricky market that we're in, um, you know, the share price has declined, although clearly you are not alone. No. Um, Rick, did you want to just have a, a chat about um, the market in general? Um, and I suppose, you know, that, um, that Greenwing and the team is doing what they can um, when will the share price go up if we had that uh, crystal ball? Yeah, well, I think there's a there's a couple of ways of looking at this to 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 a to an extent. All of the yeah, at a very very high level, um, with with some exceptions in Western Australia, and you, you can think about Azure uh, perhaps, um, but all of the all of the lithium uh, producers and developers and explorers to an extent their their share price has had they're they're not in, they're not entirely proxies of the chinese lithium price but it, it 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 is it has a significant effect on the uh, on the price and sentiment sentiment 12 months ago when that price yeah quite quite frankly uh when that price got out of control and was never going to be maintained when you when you went past five or six thousand dollars a ton for for spodumene that i think that led to some irrational um, you know, some irrational share pricing. So, but as as Peter said, we we are a, a development company. You know, we're not we're not producing for sale uh, uh, next week, or in fact next uh, or in fact next year. Uh, we have a longer term focus on that, as does as 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 do our partners. Um, I've I've had the um, the good fortune or misfortune to have been involved in the lithium industry since two thousand and six. So this would be the fourth or fifth time I've seen prices run up and run up and run down but you have to ask yourself is anybody seriously where we sit now is anybody seriously questioning the fact that we're undergoing a structural change in terms of electrification and in terms of decarbonisation I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's actually seeing or questioning that 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 thematic is somehow going to evaporate um, you know I've dealt a lot with uh, a lot with the OEMs and the automotive guys uh, no one's out there spending a lot of money building new internal combustion engines, electrification, but is 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 happening and will continue to happen. But yeah, the pace of that and the emphasis of that, um, um, and the effect of rapid supply responses, as as happened in two thousand and nineteen, and as happened again this year, will will when you have what is still a small market and a relatively immature market, it's going to have dramatic effects on um, dramatic effects on pricing. But but the the demand curve is still there, um, and uh, gives us a great deal of confidence that that you will get a, you will get a serious return out of companies like ours who who are positioned to actually you know, to actually deliver into you know, into this market you know, with quality resource about the time it's going to be need, about the time it's going to be needed. Yeah, and look, just to add to that, Mel, look, the worst thing we could do. Um, the moment we beat it down tools and stop our progress. Yeah, we're methodically working through what we think we need to do to create value. That mightn't be reflected on any given day or any given quarter. Uh, might be more accurate at the moment, but we are of a view that as we step through at um, San Jorge, as Rick said, it's a promising project and there's there's something there. Um, ultimately, that project will be of great value. Um, it's my own view, uh, exactly the same thing at Grafmada and perhaps a little bit longer term, whenever we get um, clear legislative passage with Millie's reward, there is a lot of value there at the moment. You know, we, we have a fantastic register of major shareholders now as well. Um, they've been very loyal to the company, which, which we appreciate. But you know, we continue to step through what we think is a process of value creation. Um, and, yeah, it's... It's not ideal. Um, it's not great. The current share prices, as you said, we're not alone. Some of the uh, moves in some of our peers, including us, have been absolutely staggering. Um, over the past six months, I don't personally, I think we're in that capitulation stage now, which is generally pretty close to the end. Um, you know, when's the stock price going to move? I, I think the initial catalyst 
for that in terms of equities will be um, bond rates decreasing. Um, you know, the US is supposedly considering this over the next month or two. And once those big tectonic plates um, start to move, bonds and equities and cash and other asset classes, um, you know, everything on those plates seems to move as well. So I, I don't think we are that far away uh, from a turn. And I think the turn will come. There's almost a perfect correlation between investment in small cap resources, which are effectively discretionary investment items, and um, the Australian cash rate beginning to move. Um, you know, I, I think when that cash rate begins to fall, um, discretionary investment items, be it us or other stocks in the sector, um, will be viewed a bit more favourably. Yeah. And what do we say quite often, Peter? It's uh, control what we can control. Um, exactly. yeah. So something that you can't always control, but um, when can shareholders expect assays for, from the next hole? Uh, pretty soon. Uh, we're looking to tabulate uh, the initial assays from hole four. Um, as I said, you can't really state the specifics, but we were at, sorry, I think it was 306 metres the last ASX announcement, and we're just finishing that hole up now. So investors, in the absence of specific news, can perhaps draw their own conclusions as to what that depth might be. Um, we're looking to table that and some updated information on porosity um, over the next week or so. But we think we're coming to a pretty reasonable news flow. Um, obviously, the tabling of mineral resource estimate will be fantastic. Uh, results from hole five, results from hole six, um, initial results from interactions with DLE providers. Um, you know, at the moment, I personally know it feels like firing an air rifle at a herd of thundering elephants doesn't seem to make a lot of difference at all. One broker said to me the other day, we're well, lucky it didn't go down because when companies make ASX announcements, it reminds people that they hold the stock and they sell it. So, yeah, that's the sort of market that we're in at the moment. But as I said, we will continue to methodically step through what we're doing. We believe in what we're doing. We believe that ultimately it produces long-term value for people. Um, everyone on the board has been involved and investors as well. Some of our major shareholders have been involved in material asset um, value creation and yeah, you know, I think all the portents are here, my own personal views, all the portents are here for that to happen again. We just need to be patient and not be swayed from our cause. Time for one more. Um, I've got a question. What would be the most suitable comparable project set to San Jorge for metrics, to compare metrics? Well, that's really hard to answer given we don't have a resource estimate at present. Um, you know... We have a market cap of circa $20 million and a pretty high proportion of that is cash. Um, we have a 62 million tonne resource sitting in the ground in Madagascar that has produced commercial concentrates from large flat concentrates to super jumbo concentrates all the way down to five flat concentrates um, that qualified into all major markets. You know, the Chinese export restrictions will ultimately have a really big effect on the graphite prices and it's not just... Um, the physical absence of their supply, it's you can effectively make redundant um, you know, value-added products in Europe, Japan, Korea and the US without um, graphite concentrates and especially large and super jumbo flake concentrates, which, which we produced. Um, you know, I, as I think I said at the outset, I, I view what is happening in lithium at the moment a little bit to what happened in iron ore. You know, there was a paradigm shift. All of a sudden, this big thing called China started to um, emerge in commodity markets, nowhere more so than iron ore, to a lesser degree thermal coal and coking coal. You know, thermal coal is no longer $15 a tonne. Iron ore is no longer $20 a tonne. Coking coal is no longer $40 a tonne. Um, you know, when you have a demand shift that can't be matched by supply, yes, you get short-term, as we did in iron ore, you get short-term balancings of the market. But the longer-term trend here is that there will be enduring deficits in graphite and lithium. And when Rick and I came together at the start of 2016, I think, it was our view then and it's our view now that developing assets that align with long-term structural deficits between supply and demand creates 
extreme value for shareholders. And that's yeah. still very much our view. Yeah, I think, Mel, coming back to the specifics of that question, if people are looking for for the comparators for the San Jorge project, it's a little bit difficult, as as Peter said, because we haven't got a resource. But there are there are projects that have significant value placed on them in Catamarca and and in um, uh, Salta and Huhui province. And obviously, Lake is Lake is one. Uh, Alpha uh, Alpha is another. Um, there's a couple of other projects there, but I'm I'm a little bit a little bit wary about drawing direct comparators between those uh, between those until such time as we finish this resource i think uh, this this resource drilling and get our maiden resource out then then um uh we're we're likely to be able to um have a more meaningful comparison with with some of the other companies out there but as 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 we all know from recent examples that's 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 one way of looking at the stock it's it's not certainly not uh, a methodology pref uh, preferred by the ASX in terms of putting bubble charts up and saying that because these these are all individual projects and need to be assessed on their individual merit. Yeah, as we said, it's far away that that yeah. resource. Um, I I did say we'll do, we'll do one more question. I've got a couple of minutes. Um, uh, are there any time based conditions around the initial jock resource in regards to the near ongoing investment? Is, is there time pressures? Uh, no, we're we're in uh, obviously very close contact with uh, uh, with uh, Neo, and they're happy with uh, they're happy with where we're sitting at the moment, which is producing that producing that initial resource uh, as we're targeting to by the end of uh, by the end of this quarter. Right. So we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, we there's a few questions that we haven't got to, but as I said, um, if anybody did want to throw those questions on an email to me, melissa at nwrcommunications.com.au, we can make sure that Peter and or Rick can uh, revert back, um, you know, over the next week. Um, Peter and Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it's a great um, initiative. We're going to do a series of these webinars over the course of the year. Um, and I think, you know, it, it does show your intent to and your value for the shareholders to make sure that you engage and, and provide open and uh, honest um, communication. So thank you both for joining us. No problem. Um, no, if, if I could just thank everyone for um, attending today. It in my number and emails at the bottom of every ASX announcement. For shareholders, both actual and prospective, please give me a call um, or an email with any questions that you've got. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. And uh, the webinar will be available uh, on the Green Wing Resources uh, website in due course. Thank you very much.